So I'll begin with the first question and it's related to the journal. So just a moment. Yeah. So Dr. Zimmerman, uh, one of the attendees wants to have your insight on which kind of manuscript make the cut for ACS editor's choice at ESNT. Uh, so yeah, editor's choice are nominated by the editorial team and uh, the benefit of an editor's choice uh, paper is that it becomes open access for free. Um, so it will be available to the community. Um, so editor's choice is really up to the editorial team and we are always looking for papers that are, uh, I would say seminal works or uh, if you again go to that making waves editorial are kind of these tsunami papers that set the field in new directions or ones that are incredibly relevant to topics that are occurring um, and timely in terms of policy and decision making. Um, so I would say those are kind of the three buckets of papers that we look for when we're pursuing editor's choice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. So moving on to the next question, uh, would the use of green chemistry be always sustainable? For example, some green solvents may be costly and work in narrower process conditions when compared to their conventionally used counterparts. So what's your thought on this? Yeah, so right, green chemistry is a framework and it's a um, compass. It's a set of principles to guide us in terms of how we're doing design. Um, it doesn't mean that there will be trade-offs along the way. It just means we need to continue to do our innovation to rectify those trade-offs. And on the cost side, it's really important to remember, I mean, the joke is that green chemistry was named green because it's the color of our earth, but it's also the color of money in the United States. And so the idea was this kind of chemistry needs to make environmental and economic sense. Um, and so as we get better in terms of fixing market failures and the costs and the harms of the um, molecules that are out in the environment, whether it's causing environmental damage or human health, um, right? So those aren't priced appropriately. And there are moves around the world to try to rectify some of that. We, of course, even see a price coming on carbon emissions. And so I think these price parities will start to shift as we do a better job of valuing the harm that comes from today's chemical system in so many ways and internalize those costs to the companies. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. Uh, moving on to the next question in line. So uh, microplastics pollution is an emerging area of concern. Could you please share your thoughts on mitigating this problem from the redesign philosophy that you shared? Yeah, this is a great question um, and when we get a lot about plastics, so I think it's important to remember that there are lots of plastics um, to think about and so not all plastics are bad, so we can look as chemists at natural polymers like chitin, like lignin and cellulose and say that there are some plastics or polymers that are acceptable and conducive to life and don't wind up causing these kind of microplastic harms. And so we need to design our polymers so that they are degradable under conditions that they're going to experience at end of life. And there's lots of really interesting chemistry around this, whether it's weak bonds that uh, break on a trigger and exposure to oxygen or UV light. And so that that polymer actually depolymerizes or the other strategy if we can, and it makes sense in the system is to pursue polymers that actually enter a circular economy and so that they are recovered and reused um, within an industrial system so they're not winding out, out in the environment. So uh, with bio-based solvents like limonin, when producing them consumes more energy and material resources. So how about this, Dr. Zimmerman? for bio-based solvents. So this is the same case for bio-based fuels, right? So we have examples now of doing this in ways that don't um, lead to more environmental harm. So I put up that corn-based ethanol as an example of how the US pursued um, renewable fuel standard, but we now have our carbon dioxide system that's also producing ethanol. And so there are many different uh, routes to realizing bio-based chemicals and fuels and through things like life cycle assessment and techno-economic assessment, we can help guide where we put resources for research, um, where we put capital to make sure that we're pursuing systems that are going to be sustainable and conducive to life. So 
if it doesn't make sense from an energy return on investment, it's probably not a sustainable solution. Yeah, uh, Dr. Zimmerman, uh, in line with the other question I can see, could you please comment that everywhere there is a buzz around this giga factories and decarbonization. So how to like look in future about these? Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting, and again, right, this is an opportunity to do the right thing right, which is what we want to do. So moving to uh, uh, electrified transportation sector is an exciting thing that people are pursuing. Um, but again, we need to ask questions about the batteries and what are they made out of? What catalysts are we using? Um, is there enough lithium? Who has access to it? Um, are there better technologies to pursue? And um, where is the electricity and how is it being generated? So it's great if we want to move to electrification, but if we're still relying on coal-based power, we've shifted the emissions from the car tailpipe to the smokestack from that power plant. And so this is why systems thinking and a systems perspective is so important that when we pursue these solutions, we don't pursue them in isolation in a reductionist way, but we think about the full scale of the system that we're trying to address to ensure that we're not shifting environmental burdens somewhere else. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman, can you comment a bit on how green energy has to be careful in terms of not disturbing the delicate balance of cycles in nature, a place uh, where we have badly failed with fossil fossil energy or fossil fuels? Yeah, I, uh, sadly, I, this is the same uh, answer to the previous question is really is understanding systems thinking um, yeah. and, the, and the natural system that we're working within. So if we, again, are using reductionism and pursuing one piece of a very complex system, we are often finding what we call local solutions, local minima. This is the right answer just in this isolated reduced case. But when we put it into the full scale system, it actually has unintended consequences. And so we need to pursue a systems approach as we develop these solutions. That was pretty much same. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. So uh, we have a couple of undergrad students also. So. Uh, so we would like to know how to build acumen on green engineering principles. Just some advice that you would like to share with these young audiences that would be very beneficial. Sure, I am. Um, yeah, there's lots of work uh, out there that's been published. The very first paper on green engineering principles was published in ESNT, I'm happy to say in 2003. Um, the American Chemical Society through the Green Chemistry Institute does have a lot of resources available on green engineering. Um, and uh, there are also several textbooks that have been published by uh, folks, including the editor in chief of ACS Sustainable Chemistry and Engineering, Dave Allen. Um, that's a whole textbook devoted to green chemical engineering. And that's another great resource for undergraduate students. Yeah, uh, that was quite helpful and hope the audience would find it very beneficial. Uh, we have one more uh, question uh, that I can see here. So do you have plans to work with regulatory agencies like EPA to provide guidance to industry on green chemistry? How receptive to expect industries to be green chemistry in the near future? Yeah, so that's a great question. I actually worked at the US EPA before I joined Yale University. So um, I have done work there, not so much on the regulatory side, but more on the policy side and the research side about what technologies should be funded and how do we get companies, um, what incentives are available to have companies pursue more green chemistry and green engineering beyond a regulatory floor. Um, so there is a lot of work to do. I am happy to say we've seen lots of movement in the European Union very recently as sustainable chemistries um, policy come out. And in the US, um, that Sustainable Chemistry Research and Development Act was turned into law in 2020. And so the US federal government will now be collecting data and information from companies about their use of green chemistry. The other place where we see a really big incentive right now is around accounting standards and being listed on stock exchanges. So there are a lot of companies now that um, are following these more sustainable business practices. And so there are now requirements to even be listed on a stock exchange that you show and demonstrate um, 
knowledge and understanding of green chemistry, some number of percent of products that you produce every year using those green chemistry principles. So there's lots of different policy levers that we can use from tax incentives to policy life extension to research and development tax credits um, to uh, reducing the number of times your facility is inspected. Um, in addition to just regulatory uh, kind of uh, hammers about telling people what they can't do and what they have to do less of. So the green chemistry policy arena is very much filled with how do we encourage and incentivize companies to move in this direction. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zimmerman, for sharing your insights. Uh, we have uh, executive editor from ACS Saskim who has also joined us. So he has a question, a big question. How can the next generation of scientists and engineers ensure that their contributions shift the dial? So it's a question from Pitt License. He had joined us in as attendee. Thank you, Pitt, for joining us. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, this I I should uh, have you unmute, Pete. I know you've thought a lot about this question too. Um, how do we know we're moving the needle? I think it's working on those problems that do have relevance and impact. So this comes back to the kind of science we like to publish in es and and it's the problems that we choose to work on in our lab. Um, these are ones that do have direct and significant impact on human health and the environment and our ecosystems. And so it's pursuing chemistry and engineering with a societal benefit in mind, as Jim Morgan asked us to, and not just pursuing knowledge for knowledge's sake. There is a role for that. And of course, the knowledge enterprise, we never know where new discoveries and basic discoveries will go. But if you want to move the needle and be closer to the action of seeing that happen, you got to move more towards problems that are going to be directly and immediately relevant. So uh, yeah, we have one more question. Uh, how, to make how to make life cycle assessments less, less subjective? I have read some of your papers on harmonization of LCA, but researchers do not usually normalize LCA studies. Any comment on that, Dr. Zimmerman? Yeah, this is a really interesting uh, question in the field. And I think what we're seeing in terms of life cycle assessment research is moving towards these meta-analyses. Um, so this idea of looking at, I, I just speak from my own research group, there have been, um, dozens of life cycle assessments published on using algae as a feedstock for fuels and chemicals, but they start with different assumptions, they use different process trains. Um, and so to do these meta analyses where you take all of that data and put it on the same scale and see what is really uncertain in the system from a technological perspective versus what are the uncertainties and error bars that come because we have different scopes and different assumptions built into the analyses. Um, so that is the kind of work that needs to happen if we're gonna use life cycle assessment to guide technology development. It's not a single life cycle assessment, it's really using big data approaches to look across a suite or a portfolio of life cycle assessments around the same technology and figuring out what is truly unknown um, versus why do we have confusion um, and is it because of scoping and assumptions that are built into those studies? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. So a sort of, uh, I can see it as a comment or uh, in that comment, there is something, some question that uh, one of the attendees is trying to ask, real efforts. So uh, thank you very much. This really makes one overthink what we do, but it also makes me wonder whether we ever will be able to deal with complexity, especially after realizing this needs to not only complete overview of all chemical and chemical engineering aspects, it is even broader than just all technical aspects. It even includes everything that will decide whether new technology is put to practice. So we also need economics, law and behavioral science and more. Can we really design all this or are we condemned to deal with the situation that we failed and need to correct. So uh, Dr. Zimmerman, just uh, your insight would be helpful for the attendee. Yeah, that's a big um, question and a existential one at that. Yeah. So yes, I would say, right, we as uh, the American Chemical Society think a lot about chemicals and the technological side, but certainly to put these solutions into practice requires interdisciplinary um, collaboration. And when we talk about systems thinking, 
uh, that's exactly what we're talking about is how do we understand these other systems that um, our solutions are going to go into. So I, I, you know, there's a couple answers to this. One is, I, you know, all of those systems are designed that you laid out. So whether it's our market system from economics or our legal system, right? These are human constructs. And so somebody designed those. And I often get frustrated when people say, well, the, you know, we have to work within our existing regulatory environment. No, we can design that the same we can design new molecules. And so we need to remember that those are all human constructs. And so we have the opportunity to think broadly about how we design the full system. And my other, uh, and maybe this is a good final way to end this, is that we don't really have a choice to throw up our hands and say, we can't do this because it's too hard. Um, we, we have seven and a half billion people that are you know, on the planet that need food and water and shelter and deserve a good quality of life and well-being. And so we need to figure out how to do this. And I really believe that molecular basis of sustainability is where we start. It's the most fundamental thing we do. And if we can change the very inherent nature of the materials and energy sources we use, we change much of the system. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. So just one quick question uh, as we are approaching to the end. Can we develop catalysts which are specific and can result in greater atom economy? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's lots of literature that would point to that, uh, that we um, are getting much better at designing catalysts from first principles as computational chemistry and density functional theory and all of these amazing uh, computational tools come to become more mature that we can really uh, use them to guide our design and development of catalysts that are selective and ideally made from abundant uh, elements to be selective in the reactions we're interested in. Yeah, uh, so uh, taking the last question, Dr. Zimmerman, would it be possible to go green without considering and tasking care of, taking care of the Earth's bio capability? Just a quick comment on that. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the end of that. So would it be possible to go green without considering the or taking care of the Earth's bio capability? The Earth's bio capability? Yeah, uh, so just uh, going ahead, uh, just to mean the Earth has a limit regarding the number of human beings it can accommodate. That is related uh, to the total arable land that the attendee okay. is trying to talk about. Thank you. Yeah, so this question, I guess this is really yeah, a Yeah, it's a long of... question, uh, but I tried to like <laughs> pick it in fragments. No, I appreciate that. This is really a question about population, I think. And I, uh, there is a lot of literature and data now to show that as quality of life improves, um, as people have a better, higher living standard and greater well-being, the number of children that they have goes down. And so our goal is really how to help as many people as we can reach that higher standard of living without the associated historic harm that we have caused in doing that. So again, how do we, this is the very heart of green chemistry and green engineering, how do we provide those services and goods to society without causing harm to human health and the environment? And if we can pursue sustainable development in that way, we actually see that the population problem resolves itself to a large extent.